Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for staying for this panel, which I think is going to be the most interesting, not just because I'm chairing it, but these are business leaders, uh, really extraordinary minds with a, with a global perspective who have expertise in the capital markets, who can give some perspective and insight into the capital that will finance so much of what we've heard about over the last day and a half. Uh, it's been an unbelievably substantive, full program, and so I applaud all of your stamina uh, for making it uh, to this point in the afternoon. Um, but you're in for a real treat now for this next panel. Uh, the way we're going to organize this panel is a little different than some of the other ones. We're going to have three uh, remarks, uh, relatively brief presentations. And then my job is to be Charlie Rose, uh, if you're familiar with that program, and lead a informal sort of fireside chat conversation about how private capital, uh, public money, et cetera, might finance some of the projects and the needs in the Arctic that we've heard so much about. So it is with great honor and really a pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker, Mr. Scott Minard, who is the Chief Investment Officer of Guggenheim Partners Asset Management, which is a global asset manager. And Scott is a friend, he's someone I've known for years, and I can say that as the Arctic is becoming more relevant and interesting, uh, and it's been as a co-founder of this with President Grimson and Alice and Prime Minister Kleiss, it's really extraordinary for me to see how many people are now attending this and from the uh, diverse backgrounds. Uh, Scott has been one of those people who's been interested from the beginning. So he has uh, been visiting Alaska, visiting Iceland, visiting the Arctic, and committed to this issue uh, for many years. Um, and Guggenheim, as you may say, has a long-standing tradition uh, in the region in Alaska. So uh, with that, it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce Scott Miner. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. <clears throat> Scott, thank you for your uh, very kind and generous words. Um, you know, I think I'm just going to dive right into it to keep things moving. Uh, why is the Arctic interesting to someone like me? Uh, and that is my responsibility is to troll around the world and look for opportunity. And so why would I care about what's going on in the Arctic? Well, to start with, if we were to go to slide 20, uh, we can see that the world that we're living in uh, is a world of low investment returns. Uh, it has uh, fundamentally uh, been driven here uh, by central bank policies in a post-crisis world, and the investment opportunities for a large portion of the investment community uh, are becoming more and more challenging uh, in order to meet the investment objectives that our clients have. Uh, on slide 21, <clears throat> you can see that infrastructure uh, is one of the great opportunities for the investment community. Uh, returns on infrastructure uh, have historically been much higher with a, a on balance lower volatility than many asset categories. And uh, given the dynamic of what's going on uh, in the investment community, uh, we are in an environment where we are challenged not only to get returns, uh, but to find the assets that are safe uh, and will match the needs of our investors. Uh, looking at slide 22, just taking one of those sectors, uh, which is the uh, pension fund assets and the need for long-term investment, uh, there is fundamentally a mismatch in the world and that is that long duration assets or uh, liabilities which have been piling up like pension obligations are being challenged to find uh, long duration assets that have high enough returns. And uh, infrastructure <clears throat> is one area where returns and time horizon match up with the need uh, for this investment segment uh, in particular. Uh, when you look at uh, the next slide, uh, which is the institutional appetite in the world for infrastructure, we see that on slide 23, that infrastructure uh, is the fastest growing category uh, in the uh, investor universe today. And uh, how much capital is available? Well, if we look at slide 24, 
uh, we can see that there's approximately $200 billion per year available for infrastructure investment. So you may say, hey, Scott, that's wonderful. So why are we talking so much about infrastructure today? And that really has to do with the needs of the Arctic. Um, I could stand here and talk to you uh, about uh, uh, resources that are available in the Arctic. Uh, if we look at slide four, <clears throat> we can see that 22% uh, uh, of the world's undiscovered oil and gas uh, reside in the Arctic. Uh, this is not news to most of the people that are sitting here. Uh, when you look at uh, something like oil production in the Arctic, uh, based on statistics available from the government of Norway on slide five, uh, we can see that uh, the potential for oil production in the Arctic to increase dramatically uh, is ever present. And uh, when we look at other mineral extraction in slide six, uh, we can see that uh, there is a huge amount of wealth uh, in the Arctic. However, you know, I'm not here today to talk to you about the need for capital for uh, oil extraction or natural gas or other natural resources. But what I am here to talk about is the safe development of the Arctic. We know uh, from the Rosneft experience that we should all be familiar with that uh, there are opportunities in the Arctic, and those opportunities will be pursued. Uh, the need is for us to move in a way which is responsible, uh, that can lead to uh, the safe uh, development of the Arctic, which is primarily focused on the protection of the environment, and also uh, on the uh, protection of the rights and the economic advancement of the indigenous peoples. Um, <clears throat> when you look at the ice cap uh, on slide eight, uh, we can see uh, that uh, the trend has been down. All of you know this, I'm sure. Uh, what I challenge you to do is look at this trend in your minds and realize where that line will be in 10 years or in 20 years, not today. Because when we talk about doing infrastructure and in the development in the Arctic, we are talking about where that line is in 10 years or 20 years, not right now. Because if we do not make the necessary investments in the Arctic now, when that time comes, we will be unprepared to deal with the risks uh, to the environment and to the irresponsible uh, development in this part of the world. Uh, when you look at something like slide 10, uh, you can see uh, the major impact perhaps uh, just alone on shipping in the Arctic in that it reduces uh, shipping time dramatically by using the Arctic sea routes, uh, in some cases as much as a half. Uh, and that will lead to slide 13 uh, which is the pressing need for infrastructure in the Arctic. So <clears throat> I'll stop there, Scott, uh, with my discussion, but I would like to sum it up in terms of uh, just to, ma to make the point that when I look at the Arctic, when I look at the business opportunities of the Arctic, I see an opportunity for investors like me to, to do well by doing good, by taking and leading the world to a responsible development of the Arctic, by getting the investment in place today for the infrastructure, which will allow us to, to safely navigate the future, uh, to protect the environment, and to advance the causes and rights of the indigenous nations. So, Scott, I'll be happy to take your attack later. All right, thank you. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce the Minister of Finance from Iceland, whom I just met, but whose name I've been practicing all morning. Minister Bjarnson. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a nice try. <clears throat> now, let me, let me start by saying uh, how... Uh, Happy I am to see all of you here today, and I want to 
thank the Arctic Circle for the invitation to come and speak on a very important issue. The Arctic is in Iceland indeed a major focus point with increasing potentials for business activities and other opportunities due to climate changes and increased interests in the region. But uh, alongside these opportunities, we all know there will be risks. The opportunities and the pursuit for businesses to grow will be followed by new dangers and, for example, security risks for the environment and the inhabitants of the region. Now, when asking how to balance the economic and environmental factors, we might first ask, how did Amundsen beat Scott in the race to reach the South Pole? I think there are lessons to be learned. Taking a walk into the Arctic or the Antarctic is difficult and when even and was even more difficult in 1911 when the two great explorers raced to the South Pole. Although Amundsen set forth two weeks before Scott, he won the race to the Pole by a considerable margin of five weeks. And more importantly, he did not lose his life on the way back. So what was the secret of Amundsen's success? Well, you have to dig deep into it, but at the end of the day, the answer is quite simple, really. Amundsen respected the environment and adjusted all his plannings, equipment and tactics to the extreme and harsh conditions of the Antarctic, while Scott failed to, to do so. Amundsen had learned from the Inuit people to use the Greenland dogs for hauling, the toughest breed of dogs available for the task. Scott, on the other hand, used horses and motorized sledges that all failed one on one way or the other during their long travel to the pole. Amundsen used Inuit's clothing and also skis and other equipment that had worked on the adjusted uh, on and adjusted to the harsh conditions. Scott, however, although quite keen on using new technology for the task at hand, again, failed to adjust his equipment and tactics to the ice cold weather. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I use this story to emphasize that the Arctic is no ordinary territory and to conduct businesses and invest in this vast and remote area of the world in a responsible manner requires the same determination, preparation, devotion, and clever thinking as was the case with Amundsen in his famous expedition. Furthermore, the story is a lesson on how to adopt best practices and learn from countries and experts that are familiar with the conditions in the Arctic. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that Iceland is well placed to play an important role in further economic and environmental developments in the Arctic, in the midst of the North Atlantic Ocean, right on the Arctic cycle line, and to face the challenges ahead and reap benefits from the opportunities in the Arctic region in close cooperation with our neighbors and allies. Our business community has long experience working in the high north condition, conditions and has gained know-how over the years, which we are willing and able to share with others. We do in Iceland have strong infrastructure and transportation connections that open up important access to major international markets. These opportunities are not only important for Iceland's uh, traditional resources, resource sec sectors, but also for the new 
rapidly expanding knowledge-based industries. And we see the examples already. When going around Iceland, uh, you will meet people that are already taking uh, the opportunities at hand based on the knowledge that they have gained in the Icelandic circumstances over the years. And with fisheries being one of our main economic sectors, we are more vulnerable to pollution in the Arctic than most other countries, I think it's fair to say. Therefore, Iceland has since long been aware of the importance of environmental issues for the region and all its economic developments. It is therefore of utmost, uh, utmost, important, uh, utmost importance that developments in the Arctic are based on the principles of sustainability and responsible environmental issues and responsible resource management. This is a cornerstone of Iceland's policy for the region. Security and stability in the region is another fundamental element that has to be regarded. On that issue, I strongly believe that Iceland's security interests will continue to be firmly guaranteed by participation in NATO and close defense cooperation with the United States. Conclu to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the Arctic region is well governed today by a solid and stable regional cooperation of the Arctic Council. Let me therefore make one thing clear. There cannot be any race in the Arctic region like in the days of Amundsen and Scott or, the, or like the gold rush in Klondike. That's not the way we want to move forward in this region. Without a solid framework of rule of law, there cannot be any sensible conduct of economic affairs between regional stakeholders. Respect for the rule of law is therefore the, the, one of the major elements of Iceland's policy on the Arctic and in all cooperation with other countries in maintaining security and peace in the region. And I believe the same is true for all countries seated in the Arctic Council. Thank you so much. Thank you. I now would like to invite to the stage Mr. Wei Long from the Costco Shipping Company. Thank you. As he approaches the stage, let me just remind the audience how extraordinary it is that he came. Welcome. Uh, shipping is 90% of global trade. It's the lifeblood of globalization. And their company is one of the largest shipping companies in the world. So it's a huge honor <coughs> that you came today. Thank you. Congratulations. 四千八百万载重灯的跨国航运集团，长期以来，中远集团一直关注着航运前沿的技术发展，关注北极航道的商业发展机会，并为真正实现商业通航进行了一些研究和实践。去年的八月十五号。中远集团从中国的泰昌港出发航行27天 
于九月十号顺利抵达荷兰的鹿特丹港。这次航行比传统的经马六甲海峡苏伊士运河航程缩短了两千八百多海里，航行时间减少了九天，节约缆油近二百五十吨，减少了。二氧化碳的排放，七百七十七吨，减少了二氧化硫的排放十四吨，为中远集团最大限度的履行社会责任做出了贡献，同时，也完成了中国商船首次利用北极航道的破冰之旅。女士们、先生们。中远集团一直以企业自身发展为主线，积极探索北极的航行，实现企业和各客户共同的发展。北极航线的商业机会的拓展，不仅可以扩大服务范围，为我们的客户提供更多的选择和便利。同时，还可以节省大量的船期和缆料费用，降低企业的经营成本，并可以减少缆油消耗和二氧化碳的排放，减少环境污染，最大限度的履行社会的责任。中远集团对北极航道的未来持乐观态度，目前。已经启动了冰级船舶的改造和建造计划，并将在适当的时候正式推出远东经由北极航道至欧洲的常规的海运物流服务，以积极的态度投入到北极航道的开发和利用，为北极地区和北极航道的发展做出中远集团的贡献。女士们、先生们，随着全球气候的变暖、结地水域冰雪融化速度加快，北极东北航道作为连接亚欧交通新干线的出行已经初步形成。然而，北极相对脆弱的自然环境需要我们予以更多的关注和保护。不断变化的气候同样需要我们进一步的探索。和研究，保护北极是我们人类共同的长期的责任。在拓展北极航道商业机会的同时，中远集团将在探索利用北极资源，包括航运资源时，把环境保护作为首要任务<咳>，在对北极的科研和资源的研究上进一步加强合作，在共同利用北极时。我们必须规范行为，避免无序的、无约束的开发，以保护人类共同的北极。冰岛是北极理事会的重要理事国，一直在开发北极资源、保护北极资源方面发挥着积极重要的建设性作用。中远集团将按照中华人民共和国和冰岛共和国政府关于北极合作的框架性的精神。与冰岛各界进一步加强合作，为促进北极航运的发展、保护北极环境做出我们应有的贡献。女士们、先生们，我相信有我们大家的共同努力，北极必将更好的造福人类。最后，我代表中远集团对长期关心、支持和帮助。中远事业发展的各国各界的朋友表示衷心的感谢，并预祝论坛取得圆满的成功。谢谢大家。Thank you. Thank you. So uh, before opening up the panel to conversation, we thought we'd let each of the other panelists not make speeches from the podium, but perhaps a, a brief opening comment, sort of frame their perspective on this issue. And first, let's start with you, Mead, the Lieutenant Governor of Alaska. 
Thank you, Scott. And uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you for having us here. I just want to say that it was a year ago on this stage that I was with the former mayor of the North Slope Borough, Edward Itta, who's here, and uh, Reggie Jewell of the Northwest Arctic Borough. And I said that on the issue of Arctic shipping, I didn't want either of those gentlemen to have to be woken up at two in the morning by a ship that had passed by where there had not been consultation ahead of time uh, if the ship was in trouble. And uh, I just want to say that in the last year, there's been a lot of good news in terms of building up safety in the Arctic region. In the United States, uh, the alternative compliance planning process for the Coast Guard has gotten in, and that's helped begin the creation of oil spill response organizations in our part of the world. The International Maritime Organization has uh, made some improvements to the Polar Code, and there's more coming forward. Uh, the search and rescue agreements and the oil spill response agreements, you know, it's been said that one motto in, in the Alaskan Arctic was drill, baby, drill. Uh, we actually now are seeing drills conducted under those agreements to try to make sure our safety environment is better. And as someone who was in kind of the venture development business before I was lieutenant governor, I can tell you that with any venture, what I'm trying to get for people like Scott is what I call an investable vessel. It's something, it's an idea into which you can pour money uh, to which the investor can expect a return. And for us, having basic safety on Arctic shipping is very important. And where we are today is we have people here in the audience, Scott, who uh, would like to see joint investment or development of the Port of Adak. Uh, we have people here in the audience who are interested in seeing the Port of Port Clarence move forward. We have people here who are interested in joint investment and creating the investable vessel for uh, icebreakers in, in the area. And I've seen from recent discussions with the Coast Guard a new interest in having public-private partnerships and that kind of infrastructure. And I could also tell, you know, stories of how we have helped create investable vessels in pipelines, uh, in, in uh, airports, in fact, everything on Scott's list. But the point, the point here is this, is that I believe that through Arctic cooperation, we've gotten to some of the basic safety considerations to be able to look now at investable vessels to realize the long-term opportunity that Costco uh, just explained to us. Thank you. So we've heard a lot about uh, ships on shipping routes, on the shipping uh, potential opportunities there. Mr. Kwan comes from one of the largest shipbuilders in the world. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, the ships that you're building or intend to build and, and what the, your perspective is from the shipbuilding industry. Uh, first of all, I'm very sorry because I have a big uh, catch a cold. The only change is my voice. Uh, how to catch up original one. But for the shipping and shipbuilding, now we are trying to go to year round in Arctic. Even the ice thickness is more than two meter, then you can break without ice break resistance. Even also in the Northern Sea Route, in some season, then you can sail. But in that case, the vessel should have some ice crust strengthening. So in any case, you can build any place, but not for multi-year ice. But we think the single year ice you can do. Not only the LNG carrier, but also any oil or some iron ore, nickel, any minerals or anything, you can go there. So I show you my video, my presentation to how to go in practical solution. Thank you. Thank you. So we've heard a lot about the shipping opportunities. Um, there's also mining opportunities there. And I next would like to look to Tony Hodge, who represents the mining industry, and tell us maybe what's already happening there, what, what might happen there. Give us a sense of sort of the mining uh, activities and potential, if you could, please. Thank you very much. First of all, President Grimson, thank you again for inviting me this year. Uh, short comment on the Arctic Assembly. It is a spectacular success, <clears throat> not only for Iceland, but I think it's standing as an example of the kind of collaboration, cooperation, and reaching for the higher road that the world desperately needs right now. So President Grimson and your colleagues, thank you very, very much for this invitation again. I want to make just a few small points to, to spark the conversation. We had a an organizational discussion last week amongst the panelists, and I find myself wanting to say a number of things that, that seem to 
not contradict, but coming from a very different angle, because in the mining industry, we've had our knuckles wrapped. Mining industry across the world is not the most popular industry, and we've had to learn some very hard lessons. And why I'm saying that is my plea here, is that the North and the Arctic take advantage of those lessons in moving forward, because it's possible. There are leading companies that are making a big difference. And incidentally, one of those leading companies, Tech, is going to be speaking at a panel on mining and Arctic development in a few hours in session 1F. So I urge you to come and join us for that, because there will be some very interesting things said. However, a couple of quick comments. I noticed in the Chinese presentations uh, in the previous session that there was an emphasis and a, a championing of the idea of consensus and mutual trust. And we've talked a great deal about the need to think about people and the environment of the North. But what we've discovered in the mining industry is that collaborative approach is not only essential, but the lesson is that although we need the rule of law, we need the framework that you talked about, it's not enough. It's not what's going to prevent the ship from going on the rocks. On the rocks. What's needed is a change in the behavior of people. So from their hearts and the depth of their activities, they respect the northern environment, they respect the northern people. The investment that you talked about is impatient. That's a tough issue, it's impatient. They want the return tomorrow. Maybe next week or next quarter or next year, but mainly tomorrow or even yesterday. The, Northerners, and I must tell you, um, I speak from a slight point of experience. 26 years ago, just about now, my wife and I on our honeymoon paddled in a small canoe across the Arctic Circle in the northern Yukon, and we felt the spirit of the north, the same spirit that you see here when you look to the mountains in Reykjavik. I must say that allowing the time for Northerners to understand is critical in this, and the the impatience of investment is a dilemma which we haven't, we haven't cracked yet. The need to move to behaviors in the business world, which the mining industry is finding absolutely essential in their projects in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, where communities are deeply involved at the beginning, not the end, is essential. My final point, is that I've heard very, very little discussion about something that is very real and lies behind what I say. And that is, the world's communication system has changed dramatically. The Twitters that are going on from this room are floating around the world. The people, the Gwich'in people of Alaska are in contact with the Sami, are in contact with the Kalahari Bushmen. What happens here will be known instantly across the world. And gone are the days when government and companies can go to a remote area and say, we're gonna build a mine there, this is how it's going to be, or we're going to put a port there, this is how it's going to be, or we're gonna build a railway, and this is how it's going to be. And you know, we need the infrastructure. We desperately need the infrastructure. But gone are the days when governments and large companies working in tandem can just pronounce the communities will resist, and they are resisting across the world. That's the lesson that I bring from the mining industry. We're having to learn to deal with that reality. It's a different boundary condition, and it's entirely possible, and when it happens, and when you work with communities, that's when the idea of sustainability becomes possible, because you will, will be, in fact, aligned. Thanks, Thanks. Tony. And my appreciation of the panelists, we have now set a record for speed through our opening comments, and we'll move to a conversation. We'll attempt to leave some time for a Q&A from the floor for the last maybe 10 or 15 minutes or so. We have a giant clock in front of us with a green number that says 40 in front of it, so we'll do our best to stick to that. And Tony, that might be one of the most interesting honeymoons I think I've ever heard of uh, before. Um, so I'd like to begin with uh, really the, uh, the topic of public-private partnerships. 
So this isn't going to be purely private capital, I don't think, because the projects are big and expensive and take a long time, as we've heard. Uh, on the other hand, the public sector maybe isn't prepared to sponsor these, these things alone. So maybe, Scott, I'd invite you to begin and then other panelists. Could you maybe speak to what does that model look like and what might that model look like in the Arctic? Sure. Um, I found Tony's comments very interesting. And with some of the discussions that I've had an opportunity with some people here, one of the things that I've begun to realize is that the Arctic needs a master plan. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we talk about one-off developments and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. but there needs to be an overarching vision for what uh, infrastructure looks like in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, let me just say, that's a very broad topic, mm -hmm. whether it's ports or uh, a ground transportation or search and rescue equipment or mm -hmm. communications, whatever falls into that bucket. And Tony, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that uh, this is a dialogue which must start soon and it must involve all parties, both from the public side and from the, part, the private side. Um, you're right, Tony, in that uh, investment capital is an impatient group. Uh, uh, they like to see uh, returns quickly. Uh, and I think uh, <clears throat> what we need to do, uh, in addition to developing this, this overarching master plan for the Arctic, and I'm, and I'm not talking about you know, a group of uh, you know, nine men getting in a room and strategizing. I'm talking about developing a format or a forum to open up a dialogue. Mm -hmm. so that we can get a sense of what uh, all of the, uh, uh, the needs of the Arctic are and we can start to sketch out what this looks like and what mm -hmm. it's going to cost. But additionally, <clears throat> I think we need to start developing the institutions and a framework uh, to bring capital to play. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, <clears throat> we have had some preliminary discussions about an idea uh, of a development bank. Uh, development banks like uh, the European Investment Bank or the EBRD uh, are institutions uh, which are not so concerned about instant return, uh, but are there to help uh, stimulate private investment by reducing risk and taking some of, of that uh, uh, variability and, and longer risk out of the equation, uh, which private sector money does not want. Uh, so I think that uh, working in the coming years uh, on a sort of a master plan or a roadmap for the Arctic by the Arctic peoples, uh, in addition to uh, working to develop the institutions which will be necessary to finance this, both public and private or together, uh, is, the, is probably the leading challenge that people like me have today. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Mead, if I could turn to you next. Does Alaska have a master plan, and what does the state do to help attract private capital to deal with some of these risk issues? Well, I'm not sure I would say we have a master plan, but I will say that we've got lots of experience with public-private partnerships within our state. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have a natural gas pipeline venture moving forward now, which is a public-private partnership, and the state owns one-eighth of the gas, so that's merged in. So the state will be a partner Mm -hmm. in the development of that gas. We've been very active in the development of the oil, mm -hmm. using our royalty share to develop uh, refineries and so forth. Where I would suggest, uh, in terms of Scott's master plan idea, is that there's, uh, you know, we certainly have investable vessels that will be public-private vessels in terms of ports, in terms of icebreakers. Uh, we are doing it now in terms of telecommunications. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have close to $100 billion or more worth of projects mm -hmm. that are looking for, for capital uh, that will have the public-private model with it. Mm -hmm. But I think for us in the Arctic, in terms of the master plan, there's, there's at least two industries, maybe three if you include uh, certain, some mining ideas, mm -hmm. where the, uh, more than one nation will be needed to come to the table to make the infrastructure work. Mm -hmm. And let me just say on shipping, for example, uh, there, there are several different scenarios for shipping that have been running around this room in the conversations. Uh, there's the Russian Northern Sea Route model, where mm -hmm. the Russians have icebreaker escorts. Mm -hmm. You show up, you tell them what time you're coming, you pay your bill, and they take you, uh, they take you across the top of the continent. 
Uh, there may be the unescorted vessel model, which, which uh, uh, the, uh, the shipbuilders believe we can get to now where it's just like any other ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, or it may be something where we and Iceland look at a hub, and, uh, a hub model. Mm -hmm. uh, where it's a shuttle across with heavy machinery and then connect in with regular, with regular container shipping other places. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say exactly what scenario is going to work, but mm -hmm. I do think we need to look at mm -hmm. what is the common investment going to be there. Mm -hmm. Likewise, uh, we heard from space promoters yesterday, and there's a number of things in the satellite telecommunications business where, frankly, I think Arctic cooperation has failed. Mm -hmm. in getting us the best deal for telecommunications, mm -hmm. and we could get it. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to mining, there's certainly an advantage in looking at common smelters and, and uh, you know, how to, how to combine mining with the least expensive energy. Yeah. So at least in those three areas, mm -hmm. I would say a master plan would work because it would force capital and finance ministers and governors to yeah. get, and, and presidents to get together to make the basic projects in the Arctic happen. Is that the World Bank or the Arctic Council or where, what, who helps that? Well, I, I look at the nations, the eight nations of the Arctic and, you know, uh, Norway, Alaska have large sovereign wealth funds. Yeah. Uh, uh, Iceland has certainly demonstrated uh, lots of versatility in, and capability in the finance sector. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe that uh, a new institution may bring together several of the local institutions around the north yeah. uh, for cooperation. It may, one project will probably help define it. Yeah. Bjarni, I want to come to you in a second to talk about Iceland's view of attracting foreign capital. But first, Mead said something very interesting about differing shipping models. And from the Daiwu perspective, do you have a, a preferred model for shipping in the art? What do you think is going to be the winner? So in my material, I got uh, from uh, many solutions. Because uh, Anthony and Mead mentioned about the cost matter yeah. and how to go to in tomorrow, not yeah. today. Yeah. But still, we are building Arc 7 LNG carrier. Maybe it will deliver uh, 16 uh, March in the Arctic. It means any type of ship we can go without any icebreak resistance. You know, the new Panama Canal, as beam is 49 meter, and the biggest icebreaker is 34 meter, but our island carrier 50 meter without yeah. icebreak resistance. Yeah. In terms of the going northern sea route in the winter season, yeah. or season, we need two icebreaker for bigger ship. Okay. But either Suez Max, Apra Max, or New Paramax container ship, we can go. As so, so it's a combination of models depending on the ship, the cargo, and the route. Of course, yes. Yeah. So still we are building a design for the tanker or yeah. our carrier. A lens carrier, any type of ship you can go by tomorrow. Tony, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah, I'm, the, the idea of private-public partnerships is a terrific idea. I want to bring in another dimension, though. And again, what we've seen in the mining industry across the world is that the strongest initiatives of this sort, in fact, bring together government and business and civil society. And civil society gets forgotten. And I, I think of the northern shipping issues again, um, and I think simultaneously of the environmental organizations in the world that are focused in, on marine environment. The conversation between those groups and the business groups and the governments involved in Arctic shipping should start yesterday. Um, and they're, they're not the enemy. That is a big lesson in the, in the mining industry that civil societies, people are a key part of the conversation. So mm -hmm. there's a different aspect of mm -hmm. partnership here that has to include civil society. Yeah. I really believe that. Yeah. So Bjarni, uh, Iceland is in a really exciting strategic spot, as you mentioned, for attracting investment in new businesses. And yet it's also in a very interesting moment in its history after the financial crisis and issues with the currency, et cetera. How does Iceland think about attracting private capital where it is in its moment, both, I guess, in the, in the near to medium term, but also the long term? Well, as you mentioned, I, I believe we are strategically extremely well placed in the North Atlantic. Uh, we have uh, open harbors uh, year round, and uh, there can be no doubt when you look at the shipping routes that uh, we are in the midst of the area which is uh, of importance. Um, but as you can also hear from the panel here, we are, I feel, at the beginning of a very important discussion. 
uh, there is talk of uh, new institutions to mm -hmm. come to the next step. Mm -hmm. There is talk of uh, even uh, the need for uh, development bank, as I heard mentioned, uh, and, and which is an idea which I, I believe makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, the points that have been made on the dialogue with civil society, I think, are also of very much importance. And those things are all happening already, for example, in Iceland. We have seen interests from abroad on, for example, building harbors in Iceland in rural areas where the people will uh, experience tremendous change. And if the idea is unsuccessful, it's going to be a disaster. And at this point in time, you feel like well, I mentioned the race earlier in my talk. Sometimes I feel like underneath the water there is a quiet race happening already. Mm -hmm. People are trying to find out, okay, will the port be in the east of Iceland, north of uh, Norway or possibly in Canada? And who's going to take the first step? And how are we going to include, let's say, civil society or even create a public-private partnership when we really don't feel from the gut yeah. that we have the answer. Yeah. Are we going to risk um, taxpayers' money on it? Right. Are we going to risk uh, environmental factors? Are we going to risk um, social issues, such as the ones that have been mentioned? I think those are all tremendously important questions. Yeah. At the time, to maybe more directly answer your question, at the time we see we are strategically very well located, we certainly have the interest to make the best of the opportunities at hand. Yeah. We want to see a structured uh, plan being made, and we, we like to work within the frameworks of the uh, Arctic Council. Yeah. Like I said, I believe uh, we must move forward based on a solid structure of uh, law and uh, respect of, for the rule of law. But uh, we are starting to threat waters which, uh, where we will not have all the answers. Yeah, so a lot of your comments have to do with timing. And I know, for example, we, we talk here about climate change and coming business. There's already a lot of business. The largest zinc and nickel mines are in the Arctic. Uh, huge productive fisheries are in the Arctic. There's uh, extraordinary oil and gas produ production already there. Yet a lot of these comments are about I think anticipated business with climate change that's coming. So I'd love to hear the panelists sort of view on the timing of these opportunities. Is this something that's ripening, that's ripe? Will it be next year at the Arctic Circle that we talk about sort of the investment bank has been formed and sort of there's billions of dollars being pushed out the door to finance some sort of major hub and spoke shipping system? Um, anybody have a view on the timing of when, when, this, when the Arctic opportunity ripens? Or is it, is it now, Mead? Well, you just heard Costco talk about bringing a cargo ship across the Arctic Ocean, unescorted, carrying containers going from China to Iceland. Yeah. And let's just take that scenario. Um, Asian goods going to Europe come to a hub here where they go to different points in Europe. Okay, that would mean building a larger port here or a container port here. Mm -hmm. uh, for our end of the world, you might not need to stop in Alaska on your way, but on the other hand, filling up that ship on the way back, uh, stop in Alaska at a place like Adak or on Alaska, uh, and ship, some containers may go on to Asia, some containers may go on to different points in Asia with different ships going by in the North uh, Pacific route, mm -hmm. and some may go to North America. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in that case, you would need twin ports. You would need development uh, in in this part of the world, on this side of the Arctic, as well as on our side of the Arctic. Mm -hmm. So whether we do it as a development bank or perhaps something like uh, an Arctic Sea Route Authority, uh, as, as they do in the St. Lawrence, uh, with the St. Lawrence Sea Route Agreements, uh, or uh, something when you talk about port authorities, you can look at several major metropolitan areas around the world that have be, where the port authorities have become major financing vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so if we had one group that was looking at shipping and affiliated infrastructure where yeah. our nation said we're going to go to the world together, promote safe shipping in the world together, and offer reliability, uh, which is what the, sh what the shipping interests tell us is, is, is most important. 
they want to tell the people whose goods they're carrying that they're, they're going to get there on time. And so it's going to take infrastructure on our part on both sides of the Arctic yep. uh, in order to make it work. So whether it's a development bank, Scott, or the, or the idea of a, of a shipping authority, I think it is ripe to begin those, having those kind of feasibility discussions. Yeah, so the timing for those institutions are today to build the infrastructure for the Arctic of tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think one thing I would say uh, to Governor Treadwell is I don't think a development bank or a shipping authority or a maritime authority, any of these ideas are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. The amount of capital that's going to have to go into the Arctic is humongous. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, to my chart that I, I spoke to uh, about the melting sea ice, the reality is if, if we decided we were going to just today, while we're here today, we're going to have the complete master plan for the Arctic and we're going to begin now. Mm -hmm. The reality is those deliverables are going to start showing up a decade or two from now. Mm -hmm. So if we really, you know, we hear Costco shipping through the, through the Arctic, we hear all these needs that are out there that are, are, are coming, yeah. uh, to quote Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, tomorrow is now. Yeah. So uh, if we're going to do this, we are going to have to begin now yeah. to, to get these institutions in place to make it happen. Okay, uh, great. I'd like to maybe pivot just a, a bit and, of course, tackle the elephant room in a sense, which is the business opportunities exist in the Arctic because of climate change, right? And many of the members of the audience represent environmental groups, uh, NGOs, uh, all of us actually, of course, love the environment and it's near dear to our hearts. And there's now opening access to regions uh, that used to be sort of frozen or, or less accessible. The Arctic wasn't always thought of as a emerging economy or frontier market. How, how should private capital or businessmen or investors or us in the room think about that paradox? What, what is a, and I guess uh, prefacing this last bit of the question, it's also an extraordinary opportunity because now we have, we have a chance to get it right, to, to have s truly sustainable development, a new model of investing that we're talking about here. What, what are the views of the panelists about sort of that paradox about climate change allowing more access and the investment that comes with it? Did you want to, uh, you have the microphone, Mr. Klein. Uh, I want to show my uh, presentation material, then easily understand how to go easily access. He's got a short video. Mm, short. Oh, you have a short video? Okay. Not short, but. Yeah. Um, can we see it? Please ask them. I don't control the video, no. Not, not video, but. Uh, if um, anyone's yeah. listening in the control room in the back. Some, some slide, yeah. Yeah. I already gave you my uh, PowerPoint. Uh huh. Looks like there's a mouse moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's progress. <coughs> Yeah, while they're pulling that up, Tony, could you maybe speak to that? And I'll, I'll leap, uh, and if, if they get going on this. Listen, change has happened for a long, long time. I don't think it's useful, personally, I don't, I don't this so-called paradox, it's a reason in this meeting, it wasn't, that wasn't part of the jargon last year. Um, is, what are we really saying? Do we want to encourage climate change in order to encourage business? Is that the real underlying message? I mean, it's not, of course. And so what we have to do, I think for those who wish to um, argue about whether or not there's a paradox, we should set up a room next year and put them all in that room and they can argue about that. Because what I'm really interested in doing, and quite frankly, I think people in the mining industry are interested in doing, is responding to the change that we see in a way that cares for the people in the north and cares for the environment in the north. And we need to get on with that in a practical way. Yeah. That's my sense about it. That would be an exciting room next year yeah. to have Maybe there'd be a yeah. lot of people in it too, I don't know, but I won't be there. Yeah, so it looks like we have the slides. You see the one that you need in um Hello, oh, okay. Uh, back to original, yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. President and ladies and gentlemen, I'm very sorry again for my voice. But actually, I want to show some practical solution uh, to go to Arctic 
not only Northern Syria, but also Arctic. Uh, today, yesterday and today, we're talking about uh, some political issues or some regional issues or officially anything. But I want to tell you, as a shipbuilder, ship designer, to talking about uh, shipbuilding to go to Arctic. So today, in my agenda, is three uh, segments. One is uh, Northern Sea Road. Second one is Arctic energy carrier of design basis. And third one, other uh, technical uh, features. So before going to main uh, uh, subject, I want to tell you, still uh, we TSME, still this year, more than 150 LNG carrier, especially uh, early 1990s, we built the first Korean first membrane type of LNG carrier. And year 2005, world first LNG RV. RV means regasification vessel. And third one, year 2011, world first FSRU. Then also, next year, we will deliver world first FLNG. It means in the open sea LNG FPSO, LNG factory. Uh, we will deliver to Petronas of the Malaysia. And also, year 2016, March, we will deliver world first Arctic LNG carrier. It's classed by Arc 7. It means more than 2.1 meter of ice, level ice, can break without ice break resistance. And also another one is LNG shuttle. I will acting together with FLNG. Then also, uh, still, uh, ice is melting in Arctic. So many traffics uh, depend on season. But uh, from the uh, June, uh, starting of June, and the half uh, of the, the November, almost uh, four and a half months, Arctic is open. So you can go any season around with Arc 7 class vessel. Uh, then, uh, last year also, LNG carrier sailed in Arctic Northern Sea Road. In this case, this vessel should have ice class 1A. So not only this vessel, but also so many different type of ships, container ship, tanker, or chemical vessel, any type of ship, but it requires ice breaker assistance. So then, first one, <coughs> Almost uh, July to uh, November, point and a half months. It means uh, almost uh, then uh, we think in the uh, thick ice in Arctic, normally 1.6 or 1.8 meter in first year. But in this case, we cannot sail. But open, fully deep, but vessel require ice class 1A to withstand small ice flow to hull uh, and ice interaction. Then, Actually, from the uh, Latif Sea to the uh, Bering Strait, total cargate to Bering Strait, almost uh, every speed was uh, 14 knots. It means uh, total eight days can sail to Northern Sea Road. It means uh, almost 30% uh, cut from first Korea, Japan, China to Rotterdam, or more than 50% cut from Yamal Peninsula to Far East. And then uh, this is the Yamal uh, Peninsula. Uh, Areas. Uh, then, still from Sabeta uh, to Far East, we can use that. I can show you one thing of video. Still in the Arctic, we have uh, very carefully designed any type of ship, especially in LNG carrier. We carry minus 163 degrees Celsius cargoes. But inside, also very important, then still something. Uh, spring and washer for withstand the external forces and sink. For Yamal LNG carrier, I already mentioned, the length is 300 meter, beam is almost 50 meter, much uh, bigger than the icebreaker. So it can acting without icebreaker system. Then, in order to develop this Arctic vessel, uh, many uh, so, uh, collaboration between, among the crime society, or Russian Institute, or some ice uh, model basin or something. So in order to develop the ice, then there are four major segments. So hull form to ice performance. Second thing is winterization. Third one, port system. And the last one is strength and stability and safety. So in order to go this one, we already made uh, this Arctic vessel with some uh, very nice uh, 3D model. So it will act in open sea and also in Arctic as well. So we did ice press test, actually taken from the bottom of the patient. And then 
we uh, we it is special with double acting in thin ice by bow post and heavy ice then stern post and also we are doing some uh, maneuvering test in ice model as well and winterization the design temperature of this vessel is minus 52 degrees celsius so we are carefully checking of the uh, old inside or outside all operating machinery as well so we are doing everything done and also some inside, we also checking the cold uh, temperature to radiation to internal machine. Then uh, this will uh, apply all the first uh, Arctic port system. So three Arctic Arctic port will act 45 megawatt. It's the second biggest in Arctic icebreaker, except uh, the <coughs> uh, but uh, this one also in uh, polar code will uh, prevent HFO using in Arctic. So we'll provide, the, in this case, we'll use LNG as a fuel. But second case, also all fuel tank should be protected, double hull. And so mainly we will use very low sulfur LSMGO. Then not only the uh, LNG carrier, still we are building a design for that the tanker, smaller LNG carrier, or a crude oil tanker, much bigger than conventional, but also big uh, iron ore carrier. Still, we are recently designed for 200K of the uh, dead weight of the ore carrier. So uh, very briefly introducing, uh, but also some uh, Arctic tree ship as well. Still, in, there are many places to develop oil field or gas field in uh, Russian or some uh, north part of Alaska, Canada, Greenland. So it is like for that. So uh, this is the end of my uh, presentation, very, very brief. And also it's not uh, only the last, but still anywhere we can give the, uh, solution. So if you have any idea to go to Arctic with a reasonable price, something that, please contact me and we can give you a solution. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, it takes it. I think that was a sneak pitch in there, uh, Oye. We were going to go on our conversation. And you, that was excellent. Well done. Uh, businessmen know how to pitch on the fly. Uh, so I think we'll then, we want to open this up for conversation, not leave it for the, the sort of last two questions, and then we're out of time. We've got about 12 minutes. So um, I'm going to skip you, actually, on the way through, because I think you just made your pitch. Uh, but the, um, the question is in Kramer Mad Money style, bear or bull on the Arctic and why. But that comes with the caveat, of course, of you know, this longer term <laughs> issues we described and the need to have a master plan, the rest of it. And if you could maybe just, uh, clearly Daiwu is a, is a bull on this issue. I think we could agree. Uh, bear or bull and, and maybe why briefly. And then if you want to queue up at the microphones, we'll, we'll take your questions. And um, questions, please, as you frame it, as you think, they need to be not speeches, but succinct, succinct short questions that we can succinctly, shortly answer that get through as many as possible. So, Mead, bear bull? I, I'm bull, but it's uh, join hands to jump in the pool. So That uh, rhymed, it, Mead. No, I, I, yeah. very, very seriously. It's, 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 we, we, we need to work with several nations at once, and it, yeah. can be, it can be all the rest of us without Russia, or there's things we could do with Russia at the table, and that's a very difficult geopolitical question right now. But the fact is, is that we're going to offer reliability in Arctic shipping. And that's the, there, there are people who are captive to Arctic shipping who need to bring LNG out to world markets. Yeah. So you're going to serve that market regardless. Okay? But if we're going to offer, offer the world a seaway, mm -hmm. we really do have to get several nations together. Okay. Scott? Uh, bull. And uh, to quote uh, George Schultz, uh, former Secretary of the United States, uh, Secretary of the, uh, sorry, what is he? State. Secretary of State for yeah. the United States is, this is the greatest opportunity since the end of the Ice Age. Wow. And mankind has a humongous challenge, opportunity, and responsibility in front of itself. And it's time for us to be responsible and take the lead before someone moves in and does something irresponsible with it. Bjarni Bearable. I'm very bull on the opportunities. Um, I don't want to merely talk about this from... Um, capitalist or a business point of view, but also from the opportunities that lie 
in other areas as well. I think for the Icelandic society, if we would, you know, expand the dialogue and talk also about, you know, what we have to offer, not only in terms of investment opportunities, yeah. um, you know, experience we do have in terms of search and, search and rescue, maritime safety, yeah. environmental ruling, all of those areas, uh, I think uh, we ha do have a lot of offer and I am certain and we just see it from the attendance here uh, this time around, and I think there will be more people coming next year and the year after, yep. that uh, we are talking about something that is bull. Yeah. Else, the room would be empty, I, th I believe. All right. Tony? So, listen, I, picking up from Governor Treadwell, we have to do it together, all of the countries. But, you know, we have to bring the women into the, the equation and look at the... Uh, gendered problem in this room right now, and it's not an issue we've talked about very much. Mm -hmm. It's the... <laughs> and we have to do it with the people from the communities at the periphery and the people in the center as well, yeah. within the countries, right across the board in the Arctic. Okay. Um, well, gentlemen, you are the most thoughtful bulls I've ever met. Um, why don't we start with this microphone and just run through the queue? So please, succinct, uh, question, we'll take all three of you at once, so just please succinct question for the panel and then we'll move to our side of the room, mm -hmm. please. Thank you. Maria Mock from Iceland. I would like to ask you about a humongous opportunity and asking where is hydrogen technology and icebreakers? What do you say about bringing forth the hydrogen electric technology and use it in the Arctic? as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank can, you. We, can we get the second question? Yes, my name is Rasmus Bertelsen from University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway. Um, Western-Russian energy collaboration and Russia's high north has been, shall we say, challenged reach recently. How do you see geopolitical risk for what you're talking about? And how do you think such geopolitical ri risk shall be managed? Thank oh. you. Thank you. And the third question. Hello, Miko Merit from the Polaris Group. I have just one question, quick. Uh, so if we were to create a multilateral development bank for the Arctic, what kind of governance would a court ensure a somewhat ba balance of power between states, companies, and indigenous peoples? And second question uh, linked, do you think that the Arctic Council or the Arctic Economic Council could be a base for that? Okay, so if we do a minute per answer, we can get to the other side of the room afterwards. Uh, why don't we look to Daiwu for, is there are plans on the board for hydrogen power and icebreakers or how, what's your view on hydrogen and icebreakers? Uh, as a practical solution, uh, the market is not ready for hydrogen propulsion system uh, because uh, in order to make uh, the hydrogen, then it requires much huge amount of the electricity. So still it's feasible because when you use hydrogen, emission zero, yeah. like a nuclear power, but it requires huge size of electric. Mead, can I look to you to speak to the geopolitical risk question? I'll try, but I'll also just say that uh, natural gas may be a bridge fuel to hydrogen. And you're going to see most of the major ports in the world with some sort of LNG refueling capability within a decade. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're seeing it happen in the West Coast now. Um, as, as far as the geopolitical issues, I, I don't know how to deal with, with Russia and Ukraine, except to say that uh, I, I think we have very solid reasons to work together in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And I've been criticized for saying so. And I think one path for Russia uh, to, to gain back the good stead of the rest of the world is to talk about cooperation in the Arctic. Yeah. Uh, Scott, can you maybe give us a little more color about what the bank might look like and how it might work? Well, I think, uh, you know, this is something that's on a whiteboard at this point, meaning uh, everything is subject to change and we don't have all the pieces. Um, I, I believe that all of the constituents uh, that were mentioned need to be included uh, as part of the process. And, uh, and in terms of uh, the Arctic Council's involvement, I would put the Arctic Council on a long list of all the people that would be invited. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I do agree uh, and feel very strongly that uh, this, if this institution were ever to be formed, uh, that the Arctic or the indigenous peoples need mm -hmm. to be represented. Uh, and not only do they need to be represented, but they must have a very strong say in yeah. what's going on. Great, thank you. 
Uh, so, f wow, the queue has grown. Uh, okay, so we've got five and a half minutes and four questions uh, with panelists. So please, uh, name, rank, and serial number. Lara Satrakian from Arctic Deeply. My question is for Mr. Dodge, as someone who has steered the mining industry toward better behavior and greater sustainability. I'm one of those people on Twitter, and I'm hearing how this conversation in this room sounds to people outside of this room. You know there is a massive deficit of global public trust in certain industries, mining and extractives, in certain countries. I'll leave it at that. How do you draw the lines? How do you convince the public that certain things are sacred and will remain sacred? How do you keep business accountable to the science of environmental necessity? Thank you. Next question. Hi, Edvard Glucksmann, um, University of Exeter. Uh, as a scientist, I'm worried that uh, simple researchers are being left behind. Um, how can the business community work together with uh, scientists, with the research community, uh, in order to, uh, to move forward with their own uh, business. Okay, great. Uh, next. Gillen Maxwell, The Terramar Project. Conservation always seems to be the, the orphan of business. How can you make conservation pay? Oh, wow, okay. Andrew Woodcock, Minas, Political Risk Consultants, London. A great presentation on Northern Sea Route. What a game changer in the good years. Could the panel comment on the uncertainty factor, particularly with the elements and the weather? Is it really going to be a game changer given how bad it can be in the bad years? Okay, thank you. Danielle Trudeau, my background is disaster management. We talk a lot about search and rescue, but I'm wondering um, if you can talk about how you see public and private partnerships supporting in longer term disaster mitigation and how we start those conversations. All right, so three minutes, 40 seconds to cover all those questions. I know you guys can do it. Uh, so maybe we'll start with you, Tony, and I'll give each panelist an opportunity to maybe pick which of those you'd like and some very brief sort of summary remarks to conclude, if you would. Yeah, thanks. Very quickly, conservation pay. Uh, session 1F this afternoon, the executive director of conservation for WWF International and the managing director of the Red Dog Mine in Alaska are going to participate in our panel, come to that, and we'll talk more about it at that point, I would suggest. Right. Yep. Um, trust deficit bringing change. You cannot force people into good behavior. That's a big lesson that we've, that we've come up with. There is a trust deficit. You cannot just tell people what you are doing. It matters what you do. It's the actions you take that then can allow people to judge for themselves that it's consistent with their values. Deep lesson that we've learned. That's the basis in which we operate. Thank you. Tom, Bjarni, any concluding thoughts or answers to those questions? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, for a lot of the questions that have been brought up, I think, uh, and even uh, the geopolitical risk issue, I think uh, tighter cooperation is the answer. And it's a matter that has been brought up uh, time and again. We already have formed the Arctic Council, but uh, evidently we will need to go deeper and uh, start cooperating in wider circles, not least with uh, business, uh, businesses that are showing interest. And what is interesting at the moment is that it's not only regional interest, it's global interest that is being brought to the area. Now, um, on disaster, ma disaster um, management, uh, I think, uh, again, this is the answer. So let me just conclude by saying uh, I, how much I appreciate uh, taking part here today and uh, look forward to seeing you all next year. Well, I'll just take on search and rescue. Um, you know, I think search and rescue is of critical importance in the Arctic. Uh, I think it is something that we are way behind the curve on. And uh, I think one of the greatest uh, stimulants to financing search and rescue, as well as uh, uh, trying to get responsible behavior, uh, is through an insurance mechanism uh, where you can put in place private sector incentives to put in place the things necessary to protect the Arctic. For those who aren't familiar with it, Benjamin Franklin founded the first fire insurance company, and the reason how it worked was when you paid your premium, you got access to the fire trucks to come to your house. So, um, you know, in, private sector has dealt with these kinds of issues before, and I think they can come in again. 
Conservation and science. Uh, on conservation, I can just tell you that the business opportunities in uh, renewable energy in the north are tremendous. Uh, frankly, I'd love to see the DC cable project from Iceland uh, move forward because uh, it'll help be the pathway for some of the stranded uh, uh, renewables and stranded gas projects that we've got as well. And uh, a more a northern trade and power is, is actually a very interesting concept. Uh, and there's, we're one of the best proving grounds in the world for that. As far as science is concerned, Mike McCrander was on this podium yesterday. Uh, Shell has put uh, hundreds of millions of dollars into science, putting uh, researchers to, to work. And uh, when I was chair of the Arctic Research Commission, we encouraged lots of partnerships. We have many university people here, and uh, the International Arctic Science Committee is very interested in uh, working with scientists. All right, Oleg, flashing red numbers, but you get to bring us, bring us uh, home. Only five seconds. All right. As a shipbuilder, uh, first question for the mining industry, it's a good sign uh, because the iron ore carrier uh, mining is easier than LNG carrier. So still you open one way. The second thing is the weather condition in Arctic. But still, in case of weather or some wave or something, the North Sea or North Atlantic is much higher, severe than the Arctic. Only the thing is far remote. So in winter season, 24 hours dark and something for, we have to provide a very good uh, winterization and good radar system and communication system, how to easily rescue or something. We are focused on that. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the audience for your time and attention and please join me in thanking our panelists for this presentation.